Sounds good. So thanks very much for joining and everyone stay uh, after the video. The video is about half an hour and then we'll have a question and answer section with Mike and David. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to start sharing the video now. Hi, this is our DevCon talk. Um, the topic of our talk is using containers and VMs on free public CIs uh, for fun and world conquest. Um, just a brief intro. Um, my name is David. Davis, um, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat and I work on the Pulp project. My name is Mike DiPaolo. I'm a service reliability engineer at Red Hat and I also work on the Pulp project. Okay, so a quick overview of our talk. Um, first, we're gonna talk about um, Pulp, which is the project we work on and it's sort of needed to understand um, our presentation. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about the problems we faced um, working on Pulp when we used uh, hosted CI environments. Uh, after that, we're gonna talk about when to use containers or VMs. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the different um, solutions we tested and what our results were. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about some tips for using VMs and containers with hosted CI environments. So a quick rundown of Pulp. Um, Pulp is um, a software project. Um, you use it to organize packages of software into repositories. Um, it has a plugin architecture, and we support um, a bunch of different content types. Um, you can see some examples here, Python, NPM, uh, RubyGems, uh, even Docker images. Um, and you can create a plugin for any content type uh, and extend Pulp to support that content type. Um, lastly, Pulp is entirely free and open source. Um, it's on GitHub, so if you want to check it out, there's a link right there. Um, so uh, what are hosted uh, CI environments? So these are typically free for open source projects. They're public. Um, they provide a way to build and test out your code. Um, and also, these uh, hosted CI environments uh, they let uh, communities um, fork and test using your um, CI configuration. Um, and PRs use the same CI environment as you to test um, out uh, your, your tests and stuff like that. Um, so for uh, Pulp, we use two different CI. Uh, environments or hosted CIs, we have experience with both uh, Travis and GitHub Actions. Um, and so uh, overall, they're pretty similar. Um, they do have different uh, cloud backends. Um, one uses Google, the other one uses Microsoft Azure. Um, they have the same operating system for Linux. Um, they have similar uh, specs on RAM and disk space. Um, their virtual CPUs are also similar. Uh, we ran uh, a P7-zip uh, benchmarks against them, which is a good ind indication of CPU uh, speed. Those were pretty similar. The one notable difference was um, the disk um, performance. Um, it seemed like GitHub Actions was almost three or four times faster in terms of both read and write than uh, Travis. Um, we speculate that probably GitHub Actions is using SSDs while Travis is probably using hard disks. Um, so what's the problem with uh, hosted CI environments? Uh, some problems that we encountered um, is that uh, there's a limited number of OS or distros um, by default. Um, also, the environment is pre-configured. Um, and it comes with a limited set of software packages. Um, there's also typically limited hardware resources, um, which can make um, virtualization hard. Um, and then lastly, you can't reboot or replace the kernel um, when using a hosted CI environment. Um, so to solve some of these problems, you might turn to containers. So when would you use containers? Um, 
Containers are pretty lightweight, so you probably want to um, use those. Um, some cases where you want to, would want to use them. Um, suppose you want to test against a bunch of different uh, distributions of Linux. Um, containers provide a great way to do that. Um, sometimes you might need tools like DNF, which aren't available on um, all distros. This was actually a use case for us. Um, we have an RPM uh, plugin, and we want to test using DNF to install packages from Pulp. Um, of course, Ubuntu doesn't have that, so we use it. we spin up a Fedora container to test that out. Um, you may want to use certain versions of software. Um, you can put that into a container and not glue the uh, host OS. Um, that's a good use case for uh, containers. Um, also, we had a, um, a case where um, we're using a Python package that's provided as an RPM, and it gets installed system-wide. Um, so we use a container for that to install and test out that package, um, which we don't package ourselves. Um, so when would you want to use VMs as opposed to containers? Well, one of the big use cases we ran into is that um, we wanted to test against uh, kernel modules or modes that require certain um, kernel parameters. Um, a couple of good examples are SC Linux and App Armor. Um, also, we support FIPS uh, 140-2. This is like a government standard. Uh, that forbids the use of um, weak uh, cryptographic algorithms. And CentOS and RHEL actually provide a mode um, that you can enable uh, with a kernel parameter, um, and it will actually turn off uh, the use of some of these um, algorithms. Um, and of course, you can't do that on using um, a hosted CI unless you use uh, virtualization. Um, another good example is uh, there's certain types of projects. Maybe you're working on a bootloader or a kernel module, um, and you would have to use VMs uh, in order to test out those things. So let's let's go into the uh, nitty gritty details of virtual machines versus containers, because this affects whether we can uh, run them at all in these uh, CI environments and how we have to go about running them. Uh, so like we mentioned, we prefer containers over VMs. We only use VMs when we can't use containers. And uh, the, the containers have a number of advantages. Because the container, the all the instance, all the, the multiple objects that are running share the same hardware and the same kernel, uh, there is no, uh, you know, there's no performance penalty for running them. Uh, you, you get 100% individual CPU performance, and if a process needs RAM, it's used like any other process. Whereas in VMs, you have like a 10% CPU performance hit on average, and on top of that, the host and each guest have separate unused RAM. So you could have one guest that's swapping heavily and slowing down the entire system, while another guest has a gigabyte free, and the host has two gigabytes free. And uh, there's little you can do about that uh, uh, if, if your if your VM is already running. Uh, also, virt virtual machines requ requ require a special hardware feature. This was implemented about 15 years ago, but uh, rarely can you run VMs on top of VMs. Rarely is nesting, as it's called, uh, compatible. The, that hardware feature is just not exposed to the guest for it's exposed to another guest, usually. Um, so it's important to note that both Travis and GitHub Actions, you know, uh, they are they are running in VMs. Technically, they're cloud instances, and they are like you know ephemeral and have temporary state. But for for all, for the purpose of the rest of the demonstration, they will refer to them as VMs. Uh, next slide. So, as we mentioned, we love running containers on these uh, virtualized CI environments, and that is our preferred approach. Uh, and because containers on virtualization actually always work, there's no reason why you can't run a container on top of a, a virtual machine. Uh, we are preferred, you know, container runtime environment is Podman, but the environments do bundle Docker. You, you can use that too. Docker does have disadvantages like a daemon that runs as root, but this is a temporary scratch uh, test environment, so that's not as much of an issue. Uh, but any other, uh, you know, 
uh, container solution nowadays will work because these containers just use standard features in the Linux kernel uh, to, to run. Now, virtualization on containers can work as well. It depends on whether uh, the containers have privileges to run them, but uh, that's on, so that's not relevant for the rest of the presentation though, because we've, we've been test these shared environments use virtual machines, uh, at least the ones we've tested are, are limited to virtual machines. Uh, next slide. Uh, so our, 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 we, we have good news though. Uh, we discovered that KVM actually works on top of Travis. The nested virtualization works there. We tested on Ubuntu 18.04 and we tested on Ubuntu 20.04. Uh, uh, this was a surprise to us because Travis doesn't advertise the fact that they support nested virtualization. And all the recent Q&A said it's not possible. Uh, but we ran all these commands. We ran commands like KVM OK and uh, more detailed commands to see the capabilities of the, of the C, virtual CPU. And, and it was there. And we, we, we've been running it successfully in our, in our CI now. Uh, unfortunately, it does not, this does not work on top of GitHub Actions, though. GitHub Actions, they may in the future use newer of uh, Azure instances that do support nested hardware virtualization, but not yet. Next slide. So uh, you may be wondering if, you know, if, uh, is there anything we can run besides virtual machines and containers, especially if I want on something like a virtual machine on, uh, on GitHub Actions, which we prefer anyway, because it's faster. So, you may also be wondering, what did people do before hardware virtualization was introduced in 2006 or so? Are these old solutions actually a more elegant solution from a more civilized time? Are they like a lightsaber versus a clunky blaster? Uh, next slide. Well, the answer is unfortunately a resounding no. Uh, so in the Linux world, uh, the term Plan 9 is used because it was the name of, a, of another open source operating system. Uh, and the movie Plan 9 from Outer Space, that's uh, the same name, Plan 9, refers to one of the worst movies of all time, possibly the worst. And one of the reasons Plan 9 from Outer Space is so bad is that it's convoluted and complex plot. Basically, aliens wanted to invade the Earth and rather than something simple and straightforward and efficient, like, you know, shooting us with laser guns or propelling an asteroid at Earth, they just they decided to raise an army of zombies and have them do the work for them. It's convoluted and complex. So if if our preferred plan, plan A, plan one is containers and our backup plan, plan two is uh, uh, virtual machines. Uh, well, well, let's see what the, how bad the plans three through nine are or how decent they are. Some of them actually are, you know, decent and acceptable as I'll explain. Um, I don't want to rip on all these solutions, but still. Uh, uh, next slide. So, uh, virtualization has been around longer than, than 2006. Uh, VMware basically, well, IBM in, invented it in the 1960s and then it came to x86 computers and similar uh, uh, you know, platforms in the early 2000s. So the early and mid 2000s approach uh, was software virtualization. And there still is a open source implementation of this uh, virtual box, which can run in hardware virtualization mode and by default does can still run in software virtualization mode. Uh, and basically uh, uh, the way this works is that uh, most of the time when the, uh, when the software virtualization runs the get the code inside, uh, inside the guest, um, it runs it as is. It just run, passes it directly to the CPU has no uh, translation to do. Uh, but for some of the instructions, such as instructions that run as ring zero, it has to translate those into instructions that the host can run or can run you know, safely without clobbering itself, its own OS. So uh, uh, 
because of this, there is a performance hit. And uh, in order to overcome that performance hit, these software hypervisors do a lot of tricks. They do some of the tricks that include patching the binaries that it's running so that to replace uh, inefficient code with more efficient code paths. When all of these tricks work well, you have about two thirds of the uh, 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 CPU performance of the uh, that you originally had. Um, so we tried this on on both CIs, and it it does work on both CIs. However, we soon discovered that it it's even slower than the original two thirds performance. We discovered that, be, and we assume that's because all those uh, patching and other tricks are not, have not been maintained over time, as everybody's just in the heart of it right now. It has all these other limitations that they never bothered to implement in the software mode, such as only one virtual CPU and 32-bit guests only. Now, no, hardly anybody uses 32-bit CentOS 7 and 64-bit uh, CentOS 8. I mean, 32-bit CentOS 8 doesn't exist, so that's not that's not an OS you realistically want to test against. You only want to test bit 64 bits into OS 7 and 8. Um, and then on top of this, we discovered that it was re, uh, that this feature was actually removed in VirtualBox 6.1. Like the command line argument is there, but the GUI grays it out and throws an error basically saying, you know, feature not supported. Uh, so the last version of VirtualBox to support this was VirtualBox 6.0. However, it is no longer supported. When you combine the fact that uh, this old version of VirtualBox is no longer uh, getting support, it's no longer getting any uh, micro updates, any patches, with the fact that it actually requires an out of tree kernel module, that means that any day now, Ubuntu is going to issue their own kernel update and just, you're not going to be able to build it or compile it on Ubuntu anymore. So uh, we, do, we do not recommend this approach. Uh, next slide. Um, so let's go a little bit further back in time. In the early 2000s, before uh, any open source uh, hypervisors existed, there was emulation. And the most mature emulator by far is QMU. Now, basically, the way this works is that uh, the, all, all, all of the code running in, against the, in the guest CPU has to be translated so it can run the host CPU. In fact, the host is, const is basically just breaking down every instruction and re-implementing every instruction. So it, uh, at best, it has a one-tenth of the CPU performance of the host. And this all this applies even if you're emulating x86 on top of x86. So this is it, it's a lot of work to emulate. It's a lot of performance penalty to emulate. But it is actually very elegant and works uh, really well, actually. It, QMU on top of GitHub Action Travis works exactly as intended, which is one to the CPU performance. But however, traditionally, you do get all the benefits of that. Uh, like QMU shares code with KVM, basically. So if you have multiple virtual CPUs, you can run 64 bit guess. Uh, you can use all the other features and like options to KVM that you would normally pass. Um, and it's also very simple for us to, uh, to configure Vagrant to use. Uh, QMU, we'll cover this later. But because it's so slow, it is basically your last resort. If you're running a small utility, like say a bootloader, it's fast enough. But if you're running a, a front or boot like a Linux distro, it'd be it's it'll be painfully slow. You could you wouldn't want to uh, you don't want to have like a 10 minutes or so to boot just to boot into your OS, or more even more than that. Next slide. Um, so it's worth noting that there have been other solutions uh, uh, over the years that are various types of software virtualization. But these two uh, uh, mature open source ones both require the host to run a special kernel. Therefore, we cannot run them either get it back into Travis because we can't replace the CI's kernel. Uh, next slide. OK, so now that we have our, our preferred solutions, any container runtime or uh, KVM VMs on top of uh, uh, Travis specifically, uh, let's, we now need to actually run our test code against them. And like with most CI environments, you're generally writing uh, scripts. So we need a way to programmatically access these VMs to run, and containers to run our scripts against them or individual commands against them. We'll cover how to do that, and we'll also cover our tips to optimize the performance because 
as mentioned previously, these uh, environments have very limited resources, especially RAM, only seven or eight gigabytes. Next slide. Um, so to access containers, this is the first bullet point is very well known. There is the PyMan run and the Docker run command that you can use to start your, app, your application. You can also just run like commands individually. This is designed around the premise that your container uh, runs only one process at a time. And if you need multiple processes you uh, running, you could share like file systems directly or you could uh, also uh, between them uh, or you just run the containers independently. They don't share data on disk. But say you do have a need to run a process inside a container that's already running. Say you, you're, uh, you have the daemon already running, you ran it with PyMan run, but now you need to launch a test suite against the system that say looks at the local disk to verify the data is uh, uh, there correctly, or needs to use IPC, for example, or whatever it's maybe alternatives, but it's the most efficient way to do it for your use case. So there is another command that may not know about, which is called PyMan exec and Docker exec. It just, it launches an additional process or an interactive shell in the container that's already running. Uh, next slide. So how to access virtual machines. Now this is, uh, this is a little bit trickier. So the default behavior of a virtual machine as used with like vert manager or libvirt with a, with a VNC uh, connection is virtual keyboard, virtual monitor, virtual mouse. That's not something you want to script against. Uh, and so the, mo the, the most elegant way to uh, uh, access it is to use uh, a bunch of the ut uh, utilities that are uh, called cloud init. Now these are meant for uh, you know, cloud instances uh, and uh, you know, the container, the VMs are created with the cloud init utilities on them and they expect some configuration so that the, the SSH client uh, can access it uh, fort fortunately, we can use these uh, KVM style cloud images uh, as libvirt uh, KVM VMs. Um, and I say fortunately because these KVM cloud images are very common. Basically, every single distro creates them. Uh, they may be listed as open stack format, for example, but they're perfectly usable in KVM. Um, so the specific you would start out this out by running a cloud init command called cloud local DS. This actually creates a, a virtual floppy disk with a config file in it. A config file with settings like, you know, here's the IP address of the VM and here's the SSH key I want to use to access it. And then you call the virt install command from libvirt to install the container, I mean, to install the VM with those booted with a floppy and it boots up, uses IP address and installs the SSH key and then you can just SSH into it. You, you have a fixed IP address, you can access it that way. That's the simplest way to do it. There are guides online for using cloud init with cloud local DS with all the commands spelled out, but it's not too bad. It's only like four or five commands total. Um, uh, and once you have that SSH connection, of course, you can run individual commands against the VM or you could uh, you know, uh, pat, uh, install, pass over a script and run that script. Next slide. Um, so there is a more convenient way to do all to, to create these VMs and it involves less scripting on your part. And it's also has lots of cool features to make things more convenient for doing other stuff against it. It is called Vagrant. Vagrant, the premise of Vagrant is that it helps you create a, a development environment for your application, which could also be a test environment, of course. It has a Libvirt plugin. It, 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 it creates the virtual machine. It does uh, provision it with uh, with a prisoner code such as Ansible code or Chef code or Puppet, and also facilitates all the SSH access. Um, so it, the, the, the advantage to it is that it's, it's very convenient to use and has some features you might like. However, I always hesitate to, add another, to increase the RAM usage on these, uh, can, on these uh, cloud instances. It uses a different set of images called vagrant cloud boxes. Uh, this may be a disadvantage or maybe an advantage for you. It depends on whether or not there's an images or to your liking though. Uh, and it's worth knowing that pulps, uh, C, the pulp, CI that pulp is developing actually does use this. Next slide. So uh, previously I mentioned that, uh, uh, that the, the, the virtual memory on these CI instances are very limited. 
It's uh, sev about seven gigs on each. Um, and uh, this having little virtual RAM is a very having a little RAM is a very big deal when you're running virtual machines in particular, uh, because if uh, if out of memory needs to kill a process, it can kill the entire VM. Uh, if, and even if it's containers, it could still just kill the process running a container that you may rely on. So uh, GitHub Actions actually gives you a four gigabyte swap file to overcome their small uh, virtual memory, but we uh, we recommend creating the swap file on the, as well, just as we recommend creating a swap file on Travis, a swap file in the first place on Travis. It's worth, you may be wondering why swap files, like, isn't that, is that, that's, why is that, don't you have a swap partition on your, on your hard disk on your developer system or a server? Well, uh, swap partitions are preferred, but swap files with a performance penalty do work well as, or, or the only way we can create swap space on these, uh, cloud instances because there's no blank virtual hard disk for us to access. GitHub Actions actually already uses slash mount for their four gigabyte swap file. So we just create another one that's, you know, take up the remainder of slash mount. That's our recommendation. And once again, GitHub Actions will have much faster swap space if you do end up accessing it. Next slide. Um, another performance tip we have, uh, which applies equally well to containers and VM images is to pre-build images with your application's dependencies. So why pre-build with dependencies? Well, uh, with most software projects like Pulp, our dependencies, which are in our case, a mixture of C libraries, usually from RPMs or devs or the OS and, uh, and Python dependencies change rarely. They'll change like every few weeks or once a month or so. In contrast, the uh, uh, our code changes constantly. So we want whenever whenever we want to do a pull request, we don't want to spend time making developers wait for it to install all the dependencies. We just want to install the current version of Pulp itself and test it. So therefore, we recommend using a type of a CI job called a cron job. Technically, it's not the cron like you used to, but it's 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 a CI job that's scheduled some of the cron, and with those uh. So in those, in those cron jobs, you'll build the container image or VM image, and you'll push to the registry at the end. So the registry would be, you know, Quay.io or Docker Hub, Vagrant Cloud, or directly your own place for storing VM images, um, which is via URL. Um, and then for, for containers, uh, of course, Pulp can also serve as a container image registry. We highly recommend using Pulp as well. Uh, so just thought I'd throw that out there, a little bit of self-motion, but so with containers, uh, this is a very well-known process. You know, you, you can typically, the advice is to create a container file, AKA Docker file, or use any other solution you want with a very flexible Podman with the Podman build command. But say you're just trying to do something quick and you have some other reason why you need a running container, with a bunch of running processes, and then you save the current state of the container at the end. Well, you can also use the podman commit command. It basically takes the container's temporary storage, whatever change it made to the slash file system, and it uh, creates a new file, uh, container image based on that current state of the container. Similarly, uh, with VMs, well, Vagrant Box Repackage is a great is a great way to uh, is is a well with Vagrant, you know, the images you use are called boxes, and whenever when if you're done making changes to your Vagrant box, uh, you know. Uh, dev environment, you can just run the repackage command and it creates a box based on the changes you made at runtime. Very similar to Podman commits. So another option that was missing as well is if you want a robust way to create uh, uh, virtual machines according to reproducible you know, uh, logic, uh, Packer is an open source utility that can do this for KVM. Next slide. Uh, so our final performance tip is uh, if you need to run Kubernetes. So remember, Kubernetes is a container infrastructure and it has a, a running daemon on a, on, a, on a particular node that controls the rest of the nodes, even if it's only one node. This daemon uh, is, is quite CPU and memory heavy. So we tried out multiple lightweight versions of Kubernetes and uh, either they wouldn't work on because they were 
on GitHub Actions because they were uh, actually using virtualization. That's how Minikube works, for example. Or they were not as lightweight as K3S. K3S turned out to be the most lightweight. So my recommendation is that if you are testing against Kubernetes, like you are developing a uh, you know, manifest or an operator for your uh, application that you use K3S for this. At install time, it'll default to using a bundled container D, but it also offers, lets you specify when to use Docker and these CI environments actually pre-install uh, Docker. You just enable that as a service in your CI config. And so you can do that as well. Next slide. So that's the end of our presentation. Uh, any questions for, for the orange? and for World Conquest. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, welcome back, Mike, mm -hmm. and I'm adding uh, David as well. So if anyone in the audience would like to ask questions, please do so. Uh, Mike and David, do you wanna add any comments? Or thoughts? Um, I would just, I would like to point out, like you know, we uh, we've been developing our CI a little bit more since the presentation, and we've uh, it's it's been a lifesaver being able to like run CI tests for SC Linux and FIPS mode, which we had a requirement for, you know. Yeah, very much, very much so. Okay, um, if you have any links you want to share, uh, feel free to do that. Or um, how, anyone, uh, if you want to share contact information or how anyone wants to get started or anything like that. Um, let me think for a second. I could definitely share the instructions on like using like a uh, cloud in it. Uh, that's, you know, something we referenced there. Um, there's also, I'll, I'll, I'll dig up that link right now. Uh, but you know, there are there there are multiple inside environments out there. You know, the GitHub Accents and Travis still have uh, you know these getting started guides, and they'll. But it's you have to add, you just you you'll be adding the virtualization or container layer on top of it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I certainly appreciate the presentation. It was very well done. Yeah, here, I'm sharing the link right now. Uh, Yep, and thanks, David, for pasting the uh, link to Pulp. No problem, yeah. Uh, yep. So, there yep, thanks very much. That's great. Okay, well, well, thanks, guys. I certainly appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. Yep, absolutely.